When it debuted 20 years ago, Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty was unlike anything the industry had seen before. Combining real-life history, immense irony, and meta-narrative, Metal Gear Solid 2 remains a shining example of what this ludonarrative medium can, at its best, achieve. And even if it isn't exactly the kind of story with a simple answer for every equation, MGS2 does deserve a full unpacking. This mini-series of virtual essays will attempt to do so from a story perspective, perhaps for the first time. With that, let's begin. Metal Gear Solid 2's prologue, Tanker, functions as a flashback. The year is 2007, two years before the events of the coming game. That's also two years after the events of the previous game, Metal Gear Solid 1. In those two years since Shadow Moses, leaks regarding the incident have made its events common knowledge. Having forced the sitting president, George Sears, to resign, the Shadow Moses incident has also led to the spread of Metal Gear platforms all over the world. Specifications on the secret program were leaked, sparking a miniature revolution in nuclear affairs. Proliferation now concerns not only nuclear warheads spreading, but Metal Gears as their platform spreading too. With one, whether state or non-state actor, anyone can transform themselves into a nuclear superpower. But this has led in turn to an increase in anti-Metal Gear proliferation efforts, and the main such activist outfit, the Greenpeace of Metal Gears, is the NGO formed after Shadow Moses by a handful of the incident's survivors, the organization named Philanthropy. Philanthropy owes its existence to member Nastasha Romanenko, whose best-selling expose In the Darkness of Shadow Moses, The Unofficial Truth, provided the NGO seed money to begin operations. But on the operational side of the outfit, we have Solid Snake and Hal Otacon Emrick, two heroes who already saved the world once during Metal Gear Solid 1. Now they continue the same pattern, tracking down new Metal Gears and halting their completion wherever they can. MGS2 begins when philanthropy receive forwarded intercepts of classified intelligence, suggesting that a new type of Metal Gear is scheduled for transport. This provides an opening, a golden opportunity for philanthropy to expose a U.S. military-made Metal Gear far too classified and well-protected to access any other way. The Metal Gear prototype in question belongs to the Marine Corps. Hidden deep within a disguised oil tanker, the platform, codenamed Ray, is currently being moved somewhere remote offshore. All Snake has to do is slip on board, snap photo evidence of Ray's existence, and exfiltrate before anyone's the wiser. This is how philanthropy operates, leaking digital information on Metal Gears as a kind of watchdog without borders. No terrorism, no unnecessary direct action, just disseminating information to affect the overall information flow. It is through such peaceful, non-violent methods of information control that philanthropy hopes to convince the world of its good intentions and bring more supporters to their ranks. Though all this non-violence hasn't exactly prevented philanthropy from having a massive price put on their heads. All the more reason that their activities must utilize utmost caution and secrecy. Snake's mission is simple. After sneaking on board the massive dummy tanker, Discovery, he'll head to the bridge to determine its destination. Then it's down below deck into the holds, where Snake will photograph Ray to provide the world proof of its both existence and Marine Corps origin. All this Snake must accomplish before the tanker passes under the Verrazano Bridge, where Otacon is awaiting for your exfiltration. Immediately, things start to go wrong. Snake's trapeze acrobatics get him on board, but the hard landing breaks his stealth camo. 
the decks suspiciously undermanned. And then they come. An unidentified paramilitary force silently storms the tanker, butchering every sentry in sight. Given they come in on a Kasatka transport chopper, sport AK assault rifles, and wear the Russian-made camo pattern KKO, the commandos are most likely Russian. But it's unclear whether they are state army or something else. Snake sends Hal a pic of their leader. Matching it to a name, though, will take some time. In the meantime, Snake proceeds with his mission as planned, resolving to deal with his fellow stowaways when the time comes. But I want you first to go up to the top level of the infrastructure, to the bridge. We need to find out where the tanker is headed. A little reconnaissance, huh? There's too much we don't know about this new prototype. Capabilities, deployment method, we don't even know how close it is to completion. We move up the ship's superstructure, which we find completely taken over by the paramilitaries. Along the way, Otacon informs us that the Marines are not the only military wing to pursue their own Metal Gear variant in the wake of Shadow Moses, exposing the existence of the U.S. Army's own such black project, Metal Gear Rex. In fact, this has put the Marines at odds with what should be their brother organization, the Navy, who seem to be pursuing Metal Gear technology of their own. And somehow, this connects to a mysterious organization of which Otacon can only find a name, the Patriots. The metal gear that the tanker is transporting is being developed under Marine Corps jurisdiction. But I've also heard a rumor that the Navy is working on its own metal gear. Any more info on the Navy's model? I tried to hack some out, but security was too tight. There's a lot of money being allocated, that's for sure. But every one of my investigations takes me to one name, then hits a brick wall. The name is The Patriots. Who are they? I wish I knew. I have no idea if this is an individual or an organization even. But once we expose the presence of this Marine Corps Metal Gear to the world, maybe that will shake the Patriots out of the tree. This mission is partly about that too. This mission, Otacon tells us, is partly about provoking the Patriots, who or whatever they are, into making some kind of revealing opening move. But further analysis depends on what Snake will find in the ship's nav terminal. On the way, we encounter a shockingly reminiscent sight for veterans of Metal Gear Solid 1, infrared tripwires. Except these are wired to plastic explosives. It seems these hijackers are, in fact, terrorists, and they are planning more on this tanker than a tour. Reaching the bridge, Snake determines the tanker's destination, roughly 1,000 miles off the eastern seaboard, just beyond the Bermuda, or Devil's Triangle, well outside the range of the Navy's nearest fleet. It seems there will be a field test of Ray in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean there, suggesting Metal Gear is already in its final stages of development. And it's a totally standalone weapon, operational without, in other words, any help from the Navy. But before Hal can fully process this new information, Snake is forced to deal with the commander of the unidentified Special Ops Force, when interrogation is foiled by her Spetsnaz, or Russian Special Forces, grade techniques. Before confronting her, Snake overhears crucial intel on the terrorists. It seems they, along with someone they call Shalashaska, have successfully taken the ship, cutting it off from the holds. As clear from the assemblage of bomb components nearby, they've also wired the ship with more plastic explosives to sink the tanker the minute they capture Ray. But there's some division in the ranks. The unit's patriarch, Sergei, wants his daughter, Olga, to part company with them and immigrate to America. Olga, who's been pregnant now for, based on her appearance, roughly 11 weeks, would rather fight and die, if necessary, with the unit than leave them in their time of need. Her father is insistent. Olga, a chip off the old block, is just as insistent, defiantly waving her exit chopper away anyway. And that's when we came in.
Following our showdown, mysteriously, a UAV drone shows up to snap our photo. Ironically, it turns out the photographer, Snake, has just become the subject of a different kind of photo expose than the one he had planned. But that will only become clear much later. According to Snake, this Cypher T UAV belongs not to the Navy, but to the U.S. Army. And the implications of that are huge. Let's unpack them. According to Hal, the decision to conduct tonight's mission for philanthropy came from a Pentagon database. However, what he neglected to tell us is that he never would have hacked into that database had it not been for something very unusual, an anonymous tip. The reason he neglected to mention this is also partly the only reason that Hal trusted this tip. It has to do with the name attached to its forwarding address, a name that an imitator would be unlikely to have ever learned of. The name of his long-lost estranged stepsister, Emma E.E. E. Emmerich. Now, the idea that one other entity tonight somehow got access to the same intel regarding this cruise, by which I mean the terrorists, and it was clear that they got that information the minute that they arrived after we did, well, that might have been possible to accept. But that was before the cipher appeared, broadcasting that the army clearly also knew exactly when and where to fly this drone, meaning they too had intelligence on tonight's events. Two different leak recipients, three counting philanthropy? Three isn't an accident. EE -E aside, it now really seems that someone or something has leaked tonight's top secret details to these three specific players deliberately for purposes unknown. He'll know soon enough. But whatever the reason, the army has just wound up with a picture of Solid Snake on board this doomed tanker, lording over a passed out pregnant woman. A compromising photograph, to say the least. Whatever happens next, in other words, there's no turning back. Then comes the news that Olga's doting father is none other than the financier and heavy gear supplier behind the terrorist takeover on Shadow Moses two years ago, the former Spetsnaz GRU colonel Sergei Gerlukovich. He's a Russian nationalist who sees Metal Gear as his motherland's only chance at restoring their former status as a true superpower. Have you heard from your friend, Colonel Sergei Gerlukovich, at the Spetsnaz? He still has doubts about the ability of Metal Gear. He said we can talk after Metal Gear's test launch is successful. Hmm, he's a very prudent man. There's nothing to worry about. The Colonel wants Metal Gear and a new nuclear weapon so bad he can taste it. If Russia wants to regain its position as a military superpower, they need to reinforce their nuclear arsenal. They need a nuclear weapon that can't be intercepted. Metal Gear will allow them to gain first strike capability over the rest of the world. Their regular army is in shambles, and they think they can restore their country's military power with nuclear weapons? Galukovich, he's no warrior. He's a politician. Well, he's the one who gave us the hind and most of our other heavy firepower. He's got over a thousand soldiers under his command. Didn't think Gerlukovich was involved, of all people. Ocelot's former CO, and a man with a private army of ex-Russian military and GRU soldiers. I don't like it. And Liquid was planning to team up with that bunch at Shadow Moses. All he managed to do back then was to provide a toy or two. Looks like he's had enough of sponsoring insurrections. So this time, he's out here himself. I guess he's after Metal Gear? History repeats itself. Metal Gear has enough strategic clout to upset the balance of military power overnight. He must be dreaming of Mother Russia's return to glory. He'll stop at nothing to restore everything that the former Soviet Union lost. In other words, the situation has officially, with the news that it's Gerlukovich, changed. Snake now prepares for the worst. Delayed by a feisty Russian mom and impromptu bomb disposal, by the time Snake reaches the holds, he's missed his exit, the Verrazano Bridge. Verrazano Bridge checkpoint passed. All non-essential personnel report to the holds in 10 minutes time for the scheduled briefing session with the Commandant. You are ordered to continue manning your posts until that time. 
Then he's forced to deal with a team of Russians in the dark before sneaking our way into the central housing chamber, Hold 3, where awaiting us, we find, are more than the Marine Commandant Scott Dolph and his magnum opus, Metal Gear Ray. Who or what is waiting for us, though, will itself have to wait. There's actually one little thing. Just spit it out. I'm used to things going wrong. It looks like someone's monitoring our transmission. Who? I don't have a clue. All they're doing is watching. It would creep me out less if they tried to interfere with our communications. Could it have something to do with that cipher we saw? Maybe. I've switched the encryption protocol for our burst transmission for now. What I want to do is use a different method for sending these photos, just in case. Hal's discovered signs that our entire correspondence over Codec tonight has been monitored by parties unknown. So Snake uploads his digital photos remotely using a data terminal with an app that Otacon Remote installed there through a security back door. Based on the little startup sequence we see before we upload those photos, it seems Otacon guesses Scott's password in three tries. As Snake works the lens, the Marine Commandant delivers a speech. Look at the TV over there. It's showing the hold. So that's... The new Metal Gear. Why are they broadcasting this? They probably want to keep a record of this exercise. And maybe give a little presentation? Presentation? That ship's been transmitting a live video feed via military satellite uplink for a while now. So there's some brass out there smacking their lips over this little home movie. I've been trying to pinpoint the receiving location, but I haven't had much luck. There's a heavy-duty firewall in the way. I'll try some more, though. Hal, having hacked into Dolph's personal computer, knows exactly how long you have before the speech is through. This speech explains the rationale behind Ray, what Ray is, and why the Marines need Ray to achieve both revolution and liberty. Let's explore. We, the Marines, will lead the charge into a new world order with Metal Gear Ray. This Metal Gear Ray is a prototype designed to be operated by an onboard pilot. In its final form, Ray will be unmanned driven by tele-existence and an autonomous control system. The importance of next-generation technology such as C4ISR and RMA in battle situation has been discussed time and again, but Ray is the first to deploy it so fully. With Ray's completion, the Marine Corps will lead the way for a new age of military tactics. We will proceed out of New York Harbor and conduct top-secret field testing of Ray. Shadow Moses has turned public opinion against weapons development, and this training needs to stay covert. We cannot risk jeopardizing the program on the eve of its completion. The disguised oil tanker is a part of our cover. Ray is well worth all these precautions. Trust me. The human race is about to slide back into the endless arms race of that last century, and we cannot afford to play that Russian roulette again. The Metal Gear Ray you see is here to prevent that possibility. So the Commandant says the Navy is leaning on them, huh? I'm sure the Navy isn't happy about the new Metal Gear prototype being developed. From what I can tell, the new model can make an approach, launch an attack, and execute takeoffs from the ocean without any support. If the weapon makes it past the testing stage, it could render aircraft carriers, battleships, even submarines obsolete. It's a matter of life or death for the Navy as an organization. And if it's true that the Navy has its own Metal Gear in the works, that's another reason for them to get nervous. When word came down of Metal Gear Rex, a secret weapon developed under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Army, right alongside other Army Super Special Forces outfits and projects like Foxhound and the Genome Soldiers, it put the Marines in a crisis. Ironically, this crisis was about crisis response. Militarily speaking, who does it, which branch of the armed forces gets the most funding for it, and so on. 
In the wake of the Cold War, crisis response in military operations other than war is the new focus. All of the American military's various branches outside the Air Force face massive transformation and potential desolation through budget cuts now that the Cold War is through. While the Air Force and the practice of air superiority and tactical missile strikes all remain salient, giant, traditional-sized and oriented military branches start losing their salience in the digital era. As an outfit, the Marine Corps in the 20th century had been defined by so-called amphibious warfare, usually bedressed by the Navy. But by the 1990s, they were transitioning into a standalone counter-terrorist, a so-called rapid deployment force. The intrusion of the Army with projects like Metal Gear Rex tread all over the Marine Corps' future plans. Ray is their Liberty Bell ring of an answer, their clarion call for independence. But by unilaterally deciding on building this amphibious sentinel, Ray, this anti-Metal Gear Metal Gear, by and for the Marine Corps alone to save the world and, and restore the balance of nuclear deterrence, Dolph's real goal is twofold. He also intends not only to check the growing menace of Metal Gears around the world, but to use this ultimate Metal Gear, Ray, to take his country back. It is an undeniable fact that there is a force at work in our government and within the military seeking to control national affairs to suit its own interests. Metal Gear Ray bears the burden of confronting this party, thwarting their plans and guiding this nation back to its original path. But back from whom? Well, it's simple but hard yet to put into words. It's that shadowy entity we currently know nothing of except their name. The shadowy entity presumed to be behind um, events in America, the Patriots. Not only therefore is the development of Ray a threat to say the Navy, whose mega costly giant aircraft carriers Ray renders virtually obsolete as littoral or seashore amphibious platforms overnight, it's a threat to the status quo, the illusion of peace, the Cold War's end, and behind that silver screen's many projections, the directorial, or should I say dictatorial, powers that be, the Patriots. But we knew the awesome power of this weapon. It's the power this weapon has always represented. So too does Gerlukovich know this, who wants Ray for this exact world-shifting reason, making it the all-around perfect bait to lure all three of the Patriots' enemies, Snake, Sergei, and Scott, into one place, meaning here, the tanker. And that is when the Patriots' inside man gets his chance to finally come out. The turncoat's name? Chalashaska, aka Revolver Ocelot. The implication of this scene is that Scott Dolph used the Patriots' money at some point to build Ray. What are you planning to do? Steal this thing? Steal? No, no. I'm taking it back. It's also implied that as we're infiltrating the holds and Scott is giving his speech, that Gerlukovich's men are setting themselves up in the rafters. Ocelot needed Gerlukovich's men for that needed them to detach Ray in time to get to the predetermined target spot where he would detonate the Simtex. So how did Ocelot arrange all this? Well, it seems that he made Gerlukovich think that he intended to sell Ray to him. Ocelot is a mercenary after all, who Gerlukovich apparently hired for this operation. Ocelot, by eliminating Gerlukovich's men, leaves the Marines too stunned to react, in a perfect illustration of the burgeoning military tactic known as shock and awe. Chalashaska was always the only pilot possible, the only person who had the VR training necessary to use Ray. But this extremely dramatic turn of events also lets Ocelot unveil and broadcast his whole phantom revenge arm thing, when apparently the ghost of Liquid Snake through his arm, which Ocelot grafted onto his own body, comes alive. And that is roughly when all hell breaks loose. Show's over. 
If you wish to live, I suggest you run now. This ship is still in the lower New York Harbor. You may yet make it to shore if you swim for your life. Ray, submerging for a second to take in water, activates one of its secret weapons, a water laser cutter in its mouth. Ray scuttles the tanker, drowning nearly everyone, including apparently Snake, on board. In the end of Tanker, we find out it was actually Ocelot who sent that cipher to take Snake's picture. And in the first of many fakeouts of the game, we may think retroactively that in this scene, Ocelot is talking to Solidus, AKA George Sears, the former US president who was forced out after Shadow Moses. But in reality, he must be talking to the current president, James Johnson. I look forward to tomorrow morning's new smash. I would say the Marine Corps' plans are on indefinite hold. Yes, of course, Mr. President. Well, that covers it for part one. Come back next episode, where we will turn to the main scenario of MGS2, Plant. Until next time, boss. The number fee often known as the golden ratio is a mathematical concept that people have known about since the time of the ancient Greeks. It is an irrational number like pi and a, meaning that it storms go on forever after the decimal point without repeating. Over the centuries, a great deal of lore has built up around fee, such as the idea that it represents perfect beauty or is uniquely found throughout nature, but much of that has no basis in reality. While fee is certainly an interesting mathematical idea, it is we humans who assign importance to things we find in the universe. It's always useful to step outside a particular perspective and ask whether the world truly conforms to our limited understanding of it.